Okay. Okay, so yeah, so we're reading the last few verses, um, the last section of uh, First Corinthians, right? Um, okay, so so Paul says that uh, um, chapter sixteen, verse five, that um, now I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia. If I'm passing through Macedonia, um, and it may be that. I will remain or even spend the winter um, that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. But I do not, for I do not wish to see you now, but I hope to stay for a while with you if the Lord permits. Um, so, um, you know, his, which means that his plan is not yet clear and he's, he's not sure um, what the will of the Lord is uh, about this matter so he's just saying you know if the lord permits yes uh, i will indeed uh, stay back and then uh, spend time with you uh, so on so he's you know he's depending on uh, and god's uh, uh, which means that um, his travel plans his ministry plans everything you know he's submitted to the will of god submitted to um, god's guidance right um, again something for us to learn in this then, um, then he uh, talking about Ephesus that uh, he's going to be staying for a longer time in Ephesus. He says he will wait in Ephesus until Pentecost, and the reason is uh, also this: for a great and effective door is open. So there's a great opportunity for ministry in Ephesus, uh, is what he says, and uh, and uh, at the same time. You know there are many adversaries. Right? There are uh, uh, there are many. adversary simply means uh, an enemy, uh, somebody who resists. So it is an effective door, a great opportunity, a good opportunity. Um, but there are at the same time many adversaries. So again, uh, um, learning for us is that uh, you know just because there are ministry opportunities or you know very good. Uh, ministry uh, opportunities to serve the Lord, um, that does not mean that there will be no opposition or resistance, or that, that there will not there will be no uh, you know enemies. Uh, it is possible that there will be a, you know there are advers there will be adversaries, but you you know you you see Paul's um, whole outlook towards this. He says, yeah, there there are many op uh, adversaries. The thing is that he's continuing on. Like he's continuing on to minister in Ephesus, despite the fact that there are adversaries. Okay, so he's saying. Uh, uh, so the the thing that we understand and learn is that uh, yes, when there's a open door, when we recognize that there is a uh, effective door for ministry or an opportunity for ministry, that we then we respond by stepping into that or taking up that opportunity uh, again in the will of God right because uh, he's always dependent on that uh, for the will of God but the, just the fact that there are resistant there is resistance or opposition uh, should not make us doubt and turn back right when we know that's the will of God and we, when we know that okay this is an open door uh, to minister, and in the will of God, we are here. Then, just because there is a resistance or things are difficult, right? And uh, there is a resistance to the work, uh, we should not turn back because Paul just stepped into it, knowing that there there will be resistance, um, knowing that there are you know adversaries, uh, and difficult circumstances, difficult people, uh, maybe uh, people who are uh, you know totally against the work. But even then, he stepped in. Okay, so so we that should be our mindset. That should be the way we respond to uh, open ministry opportunities. Okay, um, then in verse ten, we see uh, Paul saying, "And if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he does the work of the Lord as I also do. Therefore, let no one despise him." But send him on his journey in peace, 
that he may come to me, for I am waiting for him with the brethren. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brethren, but he was quite unwilling to come at this time. However, he will come when he has a convenient time. Okay. So here it writes about Timothy and he's saying that, um, you know, when Timothy comes, um, see that he is with you without fear. Okay. And for he does the work of the Lord. He does the work of ministry even as I do. So, I mean, that's a, uh, something that he's recognizing and acknowledging. And he's saying, Timothy is just like me in the ministry. Okay. He does the work of the Lord as I also do. He's just like me in ministering, serving. And when he comes there, let him be without fear. Because Timothy, we know, is a younger, much younger person, uh, younger than Paul, obviously, and also younger than most people in the church, right? Most people uh, uh, in the church at Corinth. So saying when he's there, you know, let him be without fear, okay? Uh, make sure that uh, you send him on his journey in peace. Send him on his journey, meaning that you know whatever he needs uh, for his journey, uh, you you make sure that you send send him on his journey, wherever he's going to from after meeting you, you send him on his journey with in peace, right? So he's he's kind of encouraging uh, you know uh, the others uh, and also attesting, affirming that uh, uh, affirming Timothy as a minister of God. And uh, not just as a minister of God, but one who does the work of ministry uh, similar to the work that he does or just as he does. Right. Um, and he says, for I am waiting for him with the brethren. Okay, so then he writes about Apollos. And we see that Apollos also, you know, ministering um, with Paul and in the places where Paul ministered. Uh, so he writes about Apollos and he's saying, you know, I strongly urged him to come to you, uh, but uh, he was quite unwilling to come at this time. He will come when he has a convenient time. And there's a, when Apollos is uh, free and when he's convenient for him to travel and visit, he will come. Okay, so, um, so, it's, uh, so we see that Paul is, uh, again, attesting the ministry of um, affirming the ministry of uh, Apollos, right? So, see, there were some people who Paul warned about, okay, about false brethren, about, uh, uh, and in Second Corinthians, we're going to see, um, you know, more of that. Um, where Paul writes about what kind of uh, ministers there are, right, uh, who are traveling and who are, you know, doing all kinds of things, and uh, it is only for their selfish gains. To watch out for them. Okay, he warns the church about such kind of ministers. But here he is encouraging the church uh, about Apollos uh, and his ministry and Timothy and his ministry. He's saying, you know, you. Uh, he's encouraging the such kind of uh, uh, ministers and also uh, and the the ministry that they do, acknowledging that, affirming that, and uh, and. And asking the church to to receive the such kind of ministers and their ministry. Okay, okay. Uh, let's read from verse thirteen. Watch, stand fast in the faith. Be brave. Be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. I urge you, brethren. You know the household of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that you have devoted. They have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints that you also submit to such and to everyone who works and labors with us. I am glad about the coming of Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus, for what was lacking on your part they supplied, for they refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore acknowledge such men. So here, after talking about uh, Timothy and Apollos, um, he goes on to encourage them and again talk about uh, a couple of other ministers. Right? So he's, he encourages them by saying, you know, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. Okay, so he's saying, you know, watch, 
the lord jesus said watch and pray that you don't fall into temptation and uh, so similarly saying you know you watch meaning be vigilant be awake be sober minded be alert right be on your guard because there is uh, an enemy so it's not time it's not the time to uh, lower your guard and um, and compromise and be complacent right he's saying be alert be vigilant um, and be watchful right just like the lord said watch and praising watch okay and then he uses another word stand fast which is uh, which means that um, you, know, you know it's it means that in the army or in the in the military that to be to be of course vigilant but um, to to be orderly to be disciplined right so first of all to be awake to be alert to be vigilant and secondly to um, to not to be disorderly to be orderly to be disciplined to be determined to be in order right in the army and especially when they march it is always in you know rank and file right everyone knows their place uh, they are not disorderly when it comes to whoever is leading them right when there is a, a captain or a centurion or whoever is there leading uh, there is always order and submission and obedience right so he's saying stand fast in the faith in a sense be disciplined be orderly do not be disorderly right thirdly he says be brave and apparently this is the only place in the new testament where you know this word is used so he's saying you know be be brave uh, and be like a man right that's that is what uh, he says andrizomai uh, the greek word which means uh, you know be brave uh, be like men or be brave um, so don't don't be cowardly but be manly or be brave right um so be brave and then he says be strong okay be fit increase in strength uh learn how to conquer and and if need be even you know uh die conquering so be strong again a uh, uh, term that is used uh for the army or in the army be strong right so um it says watch stand fast in the faith be brave be strong and let all that you do whatever you do you do it as motivated by love um that all that you do be done with love again uh it's a repetition of what he writes in 1 corinthians 13 right chapter 13 where he writes about the motive for serving the motive for the use of the gifts right the motive for all that it has to be love there has to be an exp- it has to be expressed in love you have to serve with love okay so then let all that you do be done with love you know you're being doing in the name of the lord you're doing for the you know for the benefit of the church for the edification of the church um let all that you do okay let it be done with love let it be done with uh with the god kind of love right so uh let all that you done uh, that you do let it be done with love and he says you know it's he's talking about agape there let everything that you do be done with agape um let it be unconditional and so on okay then uh, then he talks about uh, a few names this uh, stephanus fortunatus and achaicus and especially about stephanus he says they are the, they are the uh, first fruits of achaia you know they are the the people who actually became uh, believers in corinth and uh, you know we see in 1 corinthians 1 and uh, verse 16 also where he talks about you know how he baptized the household of stephanus right um, so in corinth when he came when he ministered this family this individual and this family stephanus and the household they seem to be the ones who actually uh, became believers in that region like in corinth so um, 
Stephanus uh, and his household, and uh, he, say, he mentions them as the first fruits of Achaia, and uh, that they have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Like uh, they have, uh, you know, they've given themselves to serve. They are serving the people, they're serving the ministers of God, and uh, everyone who, you know, probably they were, you know, like being hospitable to them, caring for them, caring for their needs, uh, allowing them to probably stay with them. Like so, uh, they are, uh, and also, um, you know, taking care of the of the church. Like they are taking care of the ministry of the saints. So um, devoted to the ministry of the saints. So he says, therefore, you also submit to such. You submit to such kind of people who are leaders, uh, submit to such, and everyone who works and labors with us. Okay? The ones who work with us, the ones who minister to you, the ones who are part of our team, and uh, they, they are you know, working and ministering among you. So uh, such people, you know, you submit to them. Okay? And, uh, and then he says, I'm glad about the coming of Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus for what was lacking on your part they they supplied so they seem to have taken care of some needs of Paul and uh, he says um, you know uh, they, uh, they uh, whatever was lacking there uh, supplied for they refreshed my spirit and yours therefore acknowledge such men so he's saying be submitted to such kind of uh, people leaders and acknowledge such men okay recognize them and acknowledge them right the churches of asia greet you aquila and priscilla greet you heartily in the lord with the church that is in their house all the brethren greet you greet one another with the holy so he's saying aquila and priscilla greet you he's giving them you know sharing them greetings um, um, and you know we 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 see that uh, he meets with aquila and priscilla and in in the book of Acts, uh, when on his journey, he writes about them, and uh, and how uh, uh, they are also of the similar trade, right? So he mentions that also, and uh, how he stayed with them, and he works with them, and ministers. And Aquila Priscilla also uh, those who actually help Apollos, right? They teach Apollos uh, the word of the Lord accurately, and uh, and so on. Right, um, so we read about that in Acts chapter eighteen. Right? Acts chapter eighteen, he meets uh, Aquila and Priscilla uh, in Corinth, and uh, in, in, sorry, in Pontus, and uh, and then he meets he meets with them. He spends time with them. Also, um, we read about Aquila and Priscilla uh, helping ministering to Apollos. Um, we read that towards the end of that same chapter, Acts chapter eighteen. Okay, and um, okay. Then he also says that all the brethren greet you, greet one another with a holy kiss. So this is uh, a way of greeting that uh, the church had. So which was again, you know, we, we read about uh, something that was cultural, like head covering. This is also something that is uh, cultural. Uh, um, so cultural way of greeting one another. So so he mentions that, and. Uh, and then he ends by saying, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus, you know, let him be accursed. O oh Lord, come. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Okay, so so ends the, you know, so he ends the epistle with these greetings. Um, and also uh, uh, the greetings from the other believers like uh, Priscilla and Aquila. Um, so we see Priscilla and Aquila actually. Um, you know, uh, doing ministry, and they are giving leadership to the church, and the church is meeting in their house. Okay, so, um, so we see, you know, again, when it comes to the church, you know, where they meet, church is the people of God. So, it's uh, uh, it's uh, it's scriptural. You know, where, wherever the church, whether the people of God meet, they are the church. So here they are meeting in there house so the church is meeting in the house um yeah so we see all this here in chapter uh, verse uh, sorry chapter 16 
okay so any any questions or doubts before we uh, move on and we move on to uh, second corinthians any any questions any doubts um, it can be in uh, any of the other chapters also what we looked at earlier um, first corinthians Okay, um, any questions at all? Okay, so he, he covers quite a bit of, um, um, you know, instructions and, uh, and we see um, Paul actually, you know, saying that now concerning this, now concerning this. And so he writes about, you know, food of idols concerning marriage, concerning, um, uh, concerning, uh, you know, gifts, uh, gifts of the spirit. Uh, so about head covering, about headships, uh, and so on. So about the resurrection, right? so many things um, he he teaches, he lays down, uh, and uh, yeah, so he does that. Right? Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on. If there are no questions, um, you're free to ask, of course, even during uh, our you know, our uh, study into Second Corinthians. If there is anything that comes up, you know, you can always uh, ask. Okay. Um, okay. So let's look at Second um, Corinthians. Um, I think I've not uh, uploaded the Second uh, Corinthians notes, but I will. I'll do that. Um, I'll do that at the end of this class, so you can you know follow that Second um, Corinthians as well. Right. Okay. Um, let me just check, have I uploaded it? Um, I think i um, yet to upload it, yes. Okay, course notes, I will put it up, right? So you can follow it. Um, okay, so let's look at, uh, you know, Second Corinthians. So Second Corinthians, so Paul, um, you know, finishes this letter and First Corinthians was probably uh, written around AD 52, 53, 50, we don't know, approximately around that time, right? And um, so people who came from Corinth or, um, or you know, we, we read about uh, the household of um, Phoebe, right? So they, uh, sorry, Chloe, sorry, Chloe's household. Um, in chapter 1, 1 Corinthians 1, uh, verse 11, it talks about, you know, Chloe's household that he hears about these things happening from this, you know, Chloe's household. So it could be either some of them who visited him, who took back the epistle to Corinth to to be read in the church, to be shared with the church, or it could be Titus uh, who did that because we read that uh, you know, Second Corinthians uh, chapter two. Um, let me just read that verse, Second Corinthians 2, uh, and then verse 12. Um, you know, he goes to Troas to, to preach Christ and says there, a door was opened to me by the Lord. I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus, my brother, but taking my leave of them, I departed for Macedonia. Now, thanks be to, you know, he, he goes on to write about that. So it, it could have been, um, you know, he was waiting for Titus to meet with him. And uh, so he, it does not find him there in Troas. Um, so it maybe it was uh, Titus was sent to, um, uh, you know, uh, sent back to Corinth who carried the letter. Okay. Um, so he says um, that he planned to stay in Ephesus. Uh, until Pentecost, in chapter you know chapter sixteen we read that, and then visit them at a, at a convenient time, uh, visit them meaning visit Corinth. Um, so we know that uh, from Ephesus, Paul went on to Macedonia. Okay, so the Macedonia area would uh, would include cities like Neapolis, Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. Okay, see, if you look at Acts chapter 20 and verse 1, 
okay uh, so acts chapter 19 is, a, is a, about what happened in ephesus and from there we see that he goes to uh, macedonia okay uh, and then from there uh, he, he travels there and we look and look at some of those uh, cities that are mentioned there in the macedonian region it's berea philippi and thessalonica and so on okay so this region he traveled and and while in this region is when uh, he writes second corinthians the second uh, what we know as the second epistle of to the corinthians second corinthians he writes from there and um, and he was paul went goes through a very difficult time in uh, in ephesus uh, sorry in macedonia right so a lot of suffering a lot of difficulties uh, and he's um, uh, he is comforted by uh, titus's arrival and when titus comes and meets him he's comforted and uh, he you know he he writes about that um also and uh, and we see that from here that uh, who all right uh, titus comes meets with him and uh, we see in second corinthians 7 chapter 7 and verses 5 to 7 um you know we, we came to macedonia we our bodies had no rest we were troubled on every side um, verse 5 right outside were conflicts inside we fears nevertheless god who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of titus and not only by the by his coming but also by the consolation which which he was comforted in you when he told us of your earnest desire your mourning your zeal for me so that i rejoice even more so uh, titus uh, you know from corinth titus is meeting uh, paul at uh, in in macedonia and uh, he is also bringing news of what is happening in the church at corinth right so he's sharing about that and uh, he says he was greatly comforted by titus's arrival there and uh, and so titus accompanied by other brothers right in chapter 8 we read about that uh, we'll come to that one by one but uh, so titus uh, carries the second letter second epistle that Paul writes to the Corinthians and uh, he goes from there uh, and also you know he is also supposed to uh, you know make arrangements for collection uh, which he had actually reminded them uh, which is you know which we see in first Corinthians so where he says you know uh, at the, the first day of the week you keep aside when you get when you gather so keep aside a certain sum of money so uh, so Titus goes to complete that work and collect and to and to you know uh, take that uh, collection to um, jerusalem okay, so here it with, with regard to the timeline so we know that he wrote from macedonia uh, but with regard to time we probably around ad 56 okay probably about three two to three years maybe after he wrote the uh, first episode okay so again it's an approximate time and uh, need not be uh, very accurate okay so let's uh, start with the ch chapter one um, and uh, yeah verse one paul an apostle of jesus christ by the will of god and timothy our brother to the church of god which is at corinth with all the saints who are in all achaia grace to you and peace from god our father and the lord jesus christ blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ the father of mercies and god of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by god for as the sufferings of christ abound in us so also our consolation also so our consolation also abounds through christ now if we are afflicted it is for your consolation and salvation which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer or if we are comforted it is for your consolation and salvation and our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings so also you will partake of the consolation okay so um, paul 
saying, you know, I'm called to be uh, uh, invited or appointed to be a apostle. Okay, uh, apostolos, one who's sent, a delegate, an ambassador, right, a commissioned one. So, um, so he's saying uh, that this is the will of God, right? Uh, by the will of God, again, the same way he started the, you know, the first epistle. Also, uh, he's reiterating his greeting and is reiterating the call and uh, the fact that it is by the will of God. Okay. Uh, First Corinthians also says, an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. And Sosthenes, our brother, here says, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, and uh, addressing the church. And Timothy was, um, of course, part of Paul's ministry team. And uh, he was also there uh, when the church, when Paul first went to Corinth and spent that time there uh, he was also along with Paul right, uh, in the planting of the church, and uh, definitely, you know, he is familiar with the believers or would know the believers in Corinth. So he's, he's also referring to Timothy, Timothy, our brother, and to the church at Corinth, and um, uh, uh, and says uh, uh, to and all the saints who are in Achaia. So the the church, the city, uh, the the believers who are part of the church at Corinth, right? believers are who are in Corinth, and um, so uh, the ecclesia uses the word ecclesia for the word uh, for the church, meaning the ones who are uh, assembly of those ones, so the gathering of the people who are called out for a particular purpose. Okay, called out for a particular purpose. So um, these are the saints or the sanctified ones, the believers who are called out ecclesia for a particular purpose. Okay, the gathering of the saints. Now the the gathering of the saints in the city of Corinth. So we need we, we know that Corinth is again known for its immorality. Okay, known for its uh, loose immoral lifestyle and. Uh, and there, there are these sanctified ones, the separated ones, the called out ones who are gathering and uh, who are right there in the, in the, in such a city, in such a culture. And obviously, the objective is to be an influence for good, right? To be an influence for transformation, and um, and we, as we know. You know the purpose of the church is to be and uh, be the body of Christ, right? And fulfill the plans and purposes of Christ. And uh, the church would minister, and Jesus would minister uh, in that particular place, right? So, so that is the purpose of the church. So, so we see that all these believers in that place, in that city, which is highly, which is highly immoral at that time and to obviously to bring about change and uh, so he says you know to the this letter this epistle is to the church of god at corinth the, the believers and to all the surrounding regions you know this uh, so this would apply to them as well so to be read out uh, to be read read out in all those other gatherings also you know for all those believers and as was customary, you know, Paul is talking about the grace of God. He says the grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The grace meaning charis, uh, referring to again. Uh, these are things that we know, and this, uh, you know, uh, is uh, reminding uh, as a reminder, uh, sharing this that uh, the grace of God, referring to God's favor, God's uh, uh, enablement, is empowering. God's character, right, and uh, and the gifts, right. So, grace to you. When he says grace to you, he's referring to all that, right. Referring to the favor of God, referring to the the empowering of God, and also referring to the character of God and the gifts that come from Him, not right? everything. So it's divine favor, divine empowerment, divine virtues or divine character, and also divine gifts like the uh, gifts of grace. So so he's saying, you know, the grace to you. So saying this is 
to you this comes from god and peace from god the irene meaning harmony and safety and prosperity um and he's, so in other words he's saying you know total well being and this grace let it be with you right and as believers we can walk in this and he's saying you know he's he's um, blessing them with the grace and peace grace and peace to you okay so um uh says blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ the father of mercies and god of all comfort okay so he's saying father of mercies and god of all comfort you no know, mercy and grace comes from him comfort comes from him and uh, it says uh, he's the originator god is the originator of uh, compassion or originator of comfort you know god or the father of mercies right the father meaning you know he is the he is the source he is the one from which mercy and compassion flows uh, so he's saying he's blessing you know he's praising god uh, he's praising uh, the lord jesus and he's saying you know the, the god the father is a is a source the or origin uh, originator of all mercy and compassion and also comfort okay um paraclesis is the word uses there he is the one who calls us alongside to comfort us right so he's the one who's merciful he's the one who draws us near to comfort and console okay so verse 4 who who comforts us in all our tribulation okay so paul is actually stating this uh, with uh, you know as a as a personal testimony one who has experienced the comfort of god so one who has gone through tribulations and at the same time he has also experienced uh the comfort that comes through the tribulations in the tribulation the comfort that comes from god so he's saying god is a source of the mercy uh he's the one who draws me close to him to comfort me to strengthen me uh, to encourage me so now you know i all praise to him who comforts us in our tribulation okay and and the the second part of that verse verse 4 is that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble okay with the same comfort that we have received from god okay so that's the thing the lord comforts us in all our tribulation and the purpose of that comfort is not just for us that we may in turn pass on what we have received through him okay what we have received first hand personally through him that we might be able to comfort those who are having the same kind of trouble uh, any kind of trouble with the same comfort with which we ourselves are comforted and uh, and the word you know uh, tribulation uh, this word used there is thlipsis which means uh, oppression uh, you know like a strong lot of pressure it's like it's like pressing it's like putting on you know maybe you have a stack of clothes or newspaper or something and this press it down you know it just goes down um and with with that weight of you know you pressing down it's it's some similar kind of thing so he's saying that, you know this tribulation it's like that it's just weighing down and pressing us down but god comforts us like in that situation so that we can comfort others who are also weighed down burdened and pressed down okay um and uh, so he gives the ability to do that okay so so one thing that we need to uh, understand is that uh, you know um, every tribulation every kind of trouble that we go through is um, again an opportunity for us to experience this comfort see god is a god who comforts he's a god he's the originator he's a source of comfort you know just like how we read in um, you know uh, hebrews we see that uh, looking unto jesus hebrews 12 um the author uh, the author and the finisher of our faith which means uh, the author meaning faith comes from him he's a source of faith when he speaks and when we receive it when we hear it there is faith that is birthed in our hearts the same way 
he here, God is the author, or God is the source of mercy and grace, compassion and uh, grace, and also comfort. So we, we receive that and to comfort others. But every time we go through a similar kind of tribulation, or we or others go through similar kind of tribulation and trouble and, and oppressive pressure, then we are candidates for that kind of um, mercy and that kind of uh, comfort. Right, so we we qualify, or it's an opportunity for God to, uh, you know, to release that mercy and comfort, and it's an opportunity for us to receive that mercy and comfort. Because Paul says, you know, for as the sufferings of Christ abound, verse five, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Okay, now. Uh, Sufferings of Christ abound. So it is suffering in ministry. It is uh, the trouble uh, that is uh, the, all the tribulations that are happening because of their uh, stand for Christ. So that we should understand, right? It is because they have decided to live for Christ because of the faith in Christ and because of the ministry for the sake of the kingdom of God, right? So. Uh, the sufferings of Christ abound in us. He uses that phrase, sufferings of Christ. You know, so for the sake of uh, sake of Christ, for, for the sake of whatever you know, the ministry work, sufferings of Christ abound in us. So also, consolation, comfort through Christ also abounds in us. So, you know, as this increases, uh, the comfort also increases. Right, and and in the later chapter, he he writes about the kind of uh, difficulties in chapter eleven. Right? He writes about Second uh, Corinthians chapter eleven. He writes about the kind of difficulties. You know how he was whipped, how he was uh, you know in, put in prison, and how they threw stones at him. You know uh, uh, he was uh, uh, shipwrecked, and uh, there was dangers in the sea and everything, all that he went through. Uh, how all that happened, he, it's very clearly in uh, Second Corinthians 11, right? Um, and Romans chapter 8 also talks, like when he says that you know, we triumph in all these things, you know, over all these things we triumph. Um, he writes about that also. So, so those are some of the uh, sufferings of Christ, you know, uh, which uh, abound in the life of the 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 believer and the minister and and specifically in Paul's life right so so that is something for us also you know when we go through these uh, tribulations we can be certain that we can receive the comfort from God uh, uh, tribulations of this nature or even otherwise that we can be certain that since He is the Father since He's the source we can receive from Him right uh, verses six and seven says you know the this sufferings that the Paul went through is for the sake of the gospel. Okay, um, the sufferings that they endured, the sufferings that he go through. It says in verse six, now if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. So he's saying, you know, um, uh, you you uh, also who have uh, received the comfort, you can also endure the suffering in the same manner, right? Um, he's saying, you know, um, we suffered for the sake of the, the the believers, for the sake of the church, for the sake of ministry, and there is uh, there is much fruit in the kingdom of God because of this, right? Saying which is, um, uh, and our hope for you is steadfast, because we know, we know that as you are partakers of the suffering, so you will also partake of the consolation. So he's saying, you know, we have gone through this tribulation, we have experienced the comfort. In the same way, you as the church, you as the believers to whom we ministered, even as you are partakers of the same kind of sufferings, you will also be partakers of the consolation. Right? Verse 7, so to you also, you will partake of the 
consolation. It is um, of the consolation, right? Let's look at verse 8. Okay, verse 8 onwards it says, For we do not to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and thus deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. You also helping together in prayer for us, that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. Okay, so here again, you know, if you recall, there's another place where he uses that uh, phrase. You know, we do not want you to be ignorant. You know, in the first episode also, uh, he says we don't want you to be ignorant. Um, it says uh, when it comes to the spiritual gifts, right? I do not want you to be ignorant. Um, and here also he says, you know, concerning this, we do not want you to be ignorant. So we don't want you to be without knowledge and without understanding about the kind of trouble which came to us in Asia. Right? It says it was it was really a difficult time. They were burdened without measure, uh, beyond measure above strength so that they despaired even of life. They, they thought that they would not live anymore, right? Um, so this was such was the kind of uh, difficulty. And, uh, you know, and he writes about that in, in several uh, places in, uh, in the second, first episode, of course, he writes. And here also, he writes in chapter 11 and, uh, and so on. So, um, so Paul is uh, sharing about that. And then he says, you know, we have the sentence of death, verse 9. We had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and thus deliver us. Okay, so this phrase, you know, sentence of death. Um, so what is uh, what does it mean? You know, it's, it's when we say, uh, you know, the, the court passes a sentence or the judge passed a sentence a pronounced judgment it means that uh, it's the final verdict given by the judge okay so uh, he's saying he uses that phrase sentence of death um meaning that uh, we had no hope you know there was this verdict the final verdict was pronounced and uh, the, all the discussions uh, of the case, you know, uh, everything is over, and uh, the it's as if the final verdict was passed, and we had this sentence of death. Okay, this this verdict was that uh, we should lose our lives. Okay, the, the sentence of death, and we were carrying this. We had the sentence of death in ourselves. Okay, so we, we could trust only in Christ, only in Jesus. We could trust only in the Lord. And he's saying, he's the one who raises the dead. Okay, so we carried the sentence of death, meaning, you know, there's no other go. It was as if that was the final thing. But we trusted in Christ. You know, since we were carrying, we were facing such an impossible situation, um, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God. And but this is what God does. God raises the dead. Okay, so he saying that we put our trust in him, that we our trust should be in him, in God, who does the impossible things, right? Who makes the impossible possible. So our, our trust was in him. We could not put our trust in anyone else we could not put our trust in any other human being because such was the nature of the difficulty that we went through we carried the sentence of death wherever we went okay and and he says who uh, this god who raises the dead he delivered us chapter i'm sorry verse 10 he delivered us from death 
and does deliver us and in whom we uh, trust that he will still deliver us. Okay, so the thing is he delivered us, he continues to deliver us and we put our trust in him uh, that he will, he will deliver us in the future also. Okay, so we'll stop here and then we'll continue in our next class from, uh, from verse 10 onwards. Okay, so thank you. Have a great week. God bless. See you. Bye-bye.